It is really good to have your company today as we continue on our journey through Proverbs side by side. Isn't it wonderful to know the power of friends and company? It's great to have a best friend, a person whose influence over your life has made you a better person. We all know the difference when you get the damage of bad friends, and we've seen that in the lives of others, and also in our own lives sometimes, how we can see the corrupting influences of others. Proverbs 8 is talking about making friends with wisdom, and Proverbs 9 is telling us, don't have anything to do with Miss Fool. It's like personifying the two characteristics, the virtues of wisdom and folly. It's not just giving us characteristics, but it is describing a real personality. Some of the early church fathers saw the incarnation of Jesus here. People like Athanasius, the bishop of Alexandria, who fought against the heretics in the case of Irenaeus concerning the person and the nature of Jesus. So as in verse 22, when it talks about the Lord created or possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old, Ages ago I was set up, at the first before the beginning of the earth. That's where he tended to see this. Whether this is true or not is hard to say. For the actual Hebrew, the word would suggest that it may not be speaking of Jesus, but it certainly is speaking about the character of God, and this is the wisdom he gives us. And we know the scripture says, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God. There's no doubt that this wisdom is perfectly seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Proverbs 13, 20 says clearly, Make friends with the wise, and you will be wise. The companion of fools will suffer harm. So many Christian writers have used a similar method to tell various truths, making virtues into actual characters. Pilgrim's Progress has done that with powerful effect. And it helps us really understand something of the nature of these characteristics and virtues. But let's remind ourselves again. The wise are not, as some think, clever and smart, and the fool is stupid. No, the wise are those who value their relationship with God. The fool is the one who does not. So today, three little thoughts to think about based on this. the, 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 the rest of Proverbs chapter 8. First of all, wise words. A person's speech reveals their true nature. The Bible teaches this. Out of the fullness of the heart does the mouth speak. So the person who treasures the Lord and treasures then his wise word, his wise word of Scripture and his living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be a person whose words reflect this. James chapter 3 is all about the use of our tongue. And James is a sort of a New Testament parallel to Proverbs in the Old Testament. And it talks about the power of the tongue and the wisdom of the tongue. Proverbs 8, 6 says, From my lips comes what is right. From my mouth there is uttering truth. And verse 8 says, All my words are righteous. That's wisdom. Wisdom produces wise words so that our language should change the more we embrace God's way, both public language and private language. How we speak to those in our own home is most likely more telling of our true nature than what we say to people when we're away from home. Wise words. And then wise works. From verse 22 through to 31, wisdom here is God's creation was crucial in the creation of the world. Creation experienced the power of God's wisdom. It's shaped by God's wisdom. And wisdom is actually described here then in verse 30 as the master workman who was daily beside him, rejoicing before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting the children of men. When we see the blue planet or the perfect planet on television, some of these documentaries, what we are seeing is the fruit of God's wisdom. We are seeing what's possible when God acts according to his own perfect wisdom. It's part of the story. It's a crucial mechanism of everything good, wisdom that is. And it's this same wisdom that is behind the work of God in our hearts 
God's great plan of salvation is God's wisdom. It's the way he chose to do what he has done. The foolish, that is, God-resistant and self-reliant person, says that the cross is total foolishness. In fact, the whole Bible story is foolish, as it might have been to you at one time. It certainly was to me at a time. But then, this is God's wise way. The way of sacrifice, the way of shed blood, the way of redeeming humanity. I mean, how would we have solved our sin problem successfully? Look at all the religions of the world and their solutions. So many of them work on the basis of merit and works. In other words, it's by your own effort that you, that you end up gaining your salvation. But how can a good deed remove a bad deed? It's impossible. And what is a good deed anyway? For surely we know even some of our good deeds, if not all of them, have taints of sin in them. So there's wise works, wise words, wise works in verses 22 to 31, and then wise warnings in verses 32 to 36. It ends by saying, and now, listen to me, O sons. That's that sort of introductory phrase always, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways, hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates. This is the appeal, and don't miss this appeal. This wisdom of God, the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, the means of the gospel, all appeal to us with a wonderfully hopeful offer. It ends up by saying, Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favour from the Lord. And isn't that true? Just as wisdom was in creation, so too the wisdom of God and his plan of recreation by his Spirit brings about a new blossoming of our lives, like a sort of a new Eden that maybe begins here, yes, it surely does, but it will be completed at a later date when the Lord returns or we go to be with Christ. There's a kind of a sad bit of self-harm at the end here. Whoever fails to find me injures himself, and all who hate me love death. What sobering words. This is the way we are told to understand the loss of such opportunities. Isn't that a sad thing? You know, this is obviously not a daily thought to skim. If you're a serious person and want to think more, then you need to read on elsewhere. So I'm going to encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through to chapter 4. And there you'll see a wonderful example of this wisdom as it applies to our own salvation. So I think that might be a good challenge for us this week. And then I'd just like to just remind you, if you want to follow up in a conversation, if something I say stimulates a thought in your head, a question or a comment, and you want to engage in, in a little bit more further dialogue, please, by all means, send me a message on my email. My email is John. Kirk uh, I can't even remember for a minute. John Kirkpatrick 56 at gmail.com. Had one of those moments there. John Kirkpatrick 56 at gmail.com. So if you want to, that is, uh, by all means do, because I know sometimes Proverbs presents us with complex things. And my goal is certainly not to make them more complex, if I can by any means. Anyway, it's been a delight to spend this last few minutes with you. And I hope you'll be able to join me tomorrow again. And the Lord bless you throughout this day.